In 2014, American Major League Soccer player Clyde Sims was forced to retire from the sport he loved due to his longtime battle with focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, also known as FSGS. It had unfortunately progressed to the point where he needed a kidney transplant, and although he received one in December of 2014, the organ unfortunately failed, and Sims now undergoes regular dialysis sessions. Despite this, he maintains an unwavering positive attitude and has become a passionate advocate for kidney disease research and organ donation. In this episode of the ASN Kidney News Podcast, ASN Executive Director Todd Ibrahim speaks with Mr. Sims about his personal experiences and the importance of organ donation. Hi, hi, Todd Ibrahim. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Congratulations on being inducted into the uh, ECU Hall of Fame. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's very exciting. And you've become an advocate for kidney disease research. What motivated you to become an advocate? Uh, well, I think the biggest thing is kidney disease kind of has a, a little bit of a stigma. People think that people that don't take care of themselves and they end up with diabetes and then ultimately kidney disease or they don't stay ahead of their blood pressure and things like that. And so, you know, I guess I'm a model of the fact that that's not always true and that it is, um, you know, us with kidney disease, we're very lucky because there's lots of illnesses that you can have that just there's nothing you can do about. You know, you can't, you you have a certain amount of time to live and, you know, you're just done. But with kidney disease, we have options. We have dialysis and we, you know, we have something that someone that is living can actually they, you know, everyone has two, or most people have two kidneys, and they only need one to live a perfectly normal life, and they can actually save a life while, you know, while living a, a normal one, and that's really special and something that, you know, we're very lucky. And so I think if more people knew, if more people could talk to people like, you know, my friend Portia who donated, and and uh, I've met some other people that have donated through this process, and they said it's the best thing they could have ever done with their life. You know, ultimately, I think we could actually beat kidney disease. I think it's possible, and, and it will buy us some more time until they figure out how to solve the, the big problem. But, you know, I just, obviously it hits close to home, and I'm, uh, it makes me very passionate about it. And I'm willing to go talk to people and keep trying to raise awareness where I can just so people become more knowledgeable. So how did you discover that you had FSGS? So we discovered I had something going on with my kidneys. I want to say it was 8th or ninth grade. Or maybe a little bit before that, and I think the process was over like a year or two from the time we first noticed something was up until we saw the kidney specialist. But um, it was just a routine urine sample with my pediatrician, and they noticed some protein in the urine, and they tested it, and so did it again and, and noticed the same amount. And so then they sent me to a kidney specialist to see what was going on. And so we went, and the uh, doctor said it's either one of two things, and there's this one thing, I can't remember the name of it, but it's basically something that, all, all, like, a lot of kids get at a certain age, and they get, they put them on prednisone, which is a steroid, and then it, it basically knocks it out right away. And so they said, we're going to give you this steroid. If it knocks it out, then we're good to go. If not, then there's a good chance that it is FSGS, which is basically a disease that takes over the kidney function over time. So we took the prednisone, the full dosage, and the taper, and it just it didn't go away. So the doctor basically said that, you know, this basically 99.9% that is FSGS. So we just treated it that way, and, and, and you know, um, they told me the only thing you can do really is slow it down. And to do that, you have to get on top of your blood pressure and make sure it doesn't get too high because the higher your blood pressure goes, the worse your kidney function gets, and vice versa, the worse your kidney function gets, the higher your blood pressure goes. So we had to stay on top of that blood pressure because that was the only thing we could really control. And um, uh, he said exercise and, you know, sweating a good amount and drinking a lot of water. Um, so fortunately, I was able to play sports growing up and professionally, so that really helped. Well, that took care of the, the exercising part. Um, and then we just always had to check the blood pressure out. I remember having little machines at, at home to check it every now and then and see where it was, and we had to adjust my blood pressure medication accordingly. So we noticed, uh, yeah, it was about 8th and ninth grade. So given that reality and the fact that you were playing two sports in high school and then in, in college mm-hmm. focusing on, on soccer and then playing at a professional level, and I think most people would agree that soccer is one of the most demanding sports physically. Yeah. How did you manage that? Because I know you didn't miss much time during your career and, and really you know performed at the highest levels of, of soccer. So how did you do that? Yeah, for me it was kind of like out of sight, out of mind. I, like I knew something was wrong with my kidneys, but I didn't feel any different. 
it it was happening so slowly that she took a snapshot from when I was in you know high school to when I was you know my sixth seventh year in in my less. I could probably tell a big difference, but because it happened so slowly over time, I couldn't really tell a difference. And so the only thing I could tell towards the end of my career was that I was tired a lot. I could probably take a nap anywhere at any time and had no trouble falling asleep or sleeping at night. And so you get up and, you know, go train or you go go do what I need to do with soccer, come back and usually take a nap. And it was just that that cycle. But because the hours were so short with soccer, I was able to get away with that. You know, if I had a, a nine to five and I had to be at work for a long time, I probably would have really struggled. So it was hard for me to really be able to tell a big difference. And yeah, towards the end of my career, I could tell it was taking me longer to recover after games and after hard training sessions than it was my, my teammates. Because, uh, you know, we talk about how slow we were, how we were feeling each day. And, and uh, I was always, you know, a little bit behind the eight ball. So, uh, that, you know, I just, I love to play soccer. I, you know, I did what the doctors told me and, and we continued to check my levels and, I knew that was all I could do, but as far as my career, I was going to try to enjoy it while it lasts and, and get the most out of it. So I just kind of really put it in the back of my head day to day. So what ultimately, when you decided to retire, what what was sort of what was the process of that decision? Well, when I decided to retire, well, okay, so I was a little bit forced because I had a I had a, a toe injury. It was turf toe, and I wish it doesn't sound that bad, but it's probably one of the worst injuries I've ever had. And it just would not go away. Um, and when I, when it would flare up, like I could barely walk, uh, let alone run or, or even think about kicking a soccer ball or, or cutting on it. So I decided to give that a lot of rest. Uh, but in the meantime, I knew my kidneys were getting down to around 20% uh, function or even less than that at the time. And it had been for the last probably three years of my career, it had been stable at around 20%. So it wasn't a huge issue for me. It was more of the toe. Um, and I think because the, my kidney function was so low that that was hurting the chances of, you know, my, my blood being able to heal that toe. Because, uh, you know, I had so many toxins built up and it just, my blood wasn't filtering like it was supposed to or at the normal rate. And so uh, it was a little bit of, well, it was a couple of different things. I had also, the next team that I was thinking of playing for was all the way in San Jose. So, you know, I was kind of thinking how many years do I have left and, and we're going to pick up and go all the way across the country. And, you know, I'm not even 100% with my toe. And so it became really stressful in my mind and just thinking about the months to come. And then I just thought about, I just reflected on how I was feeling in the last couple of years. And, and it, it, you know, the job just became more and more stressful because it was coming, becoming more and more difficult for me to perform day to day. And so, you know, I just called my agent and, you know, just told him, I, I think, you know, I had, my body had enough and it was trying to talk to me. So we just called it a career. But it's amazing to me that turf toe ultimately drove the decision as opposed to kidney function. Yeah. It tells you how painful yeah, it is. Yeah, and, it, it, and it's, it's so funny because my, my dad follows sports, a bunch of different sports. And I remember when I first got the injury, I called him and I told him that I was dealing with turf toe. And he was a little upset about it. He, he said that he's known it to basically end uh, some a bunch of you know professional players' careers because it's it's chronic and there's not much you can do about it. You know, I kind of brushed it off and basically fought with it the entire season, uh, or I'd say the three fourths of the season, uh, my last year, and then yeah, it just would not go away. How did you uh, first start playing soccer? Uh, I was five years old, and my father he was a, he was a basketball guy. And he basically wanted me to do something, I guess, keep busy until basketball season. So he decided to sign me up for soccer. And uh, he was actually my first coach because we, we needed a coach. And he basically learned by just reading a book on soccer. So basically kind of by accident. So what was it about soccer that you liked better than basketball? I played both all the way up until like my sophomore, junior in high school. And I was a really good basketball player. And I think I gravitated towards soccer because it ended up being more fun for me because it was less pressure. My dad, like I said, was a basketball guy, and, you know, he really pushed me to play basketball and pushed me to be really good at it. But when it came to soccer, he didn't know enough about it to know what to say, really. So I feel like I felt more free playing soccer, and I think that's why I gravitated towards it. If you sort of think back on it, who were some of the athletes that you most admired as a kid? Well, one um, was close to home, Eddie Pope. We went to the same high school. He was a lot older than me, 
Um, and I, I think I was uh, going into middle school when he was was at Southwest Guilford High School, and uh, we would hear about him, and I would follow his career uh, ever since he left Southwest, and he went and played at UNC and played football at UNC as well. And so that was a realistic goal for me because kind of in the same place as him and going through the same same things that he was going through. So I watched him, and he gave me a kind of motivation to to stick with it. And, um, you know, he ended up playing for D.C. United for years, uh, and that was his first uh, major league soccer team and, and that ended up being mine as well so you know, it, was, it was really easy just to follow his career but I, I was a, I was a big basketball fan and you know, I loved I think just like everyone else uh, watching Michael Jordan and I think one thing that I took from him and all the great players that I played with is how confident they played the game I really looked up to those guys the way they carried themselves and went about their job really it's interesting that both your examples are from North Carolina yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's another one. I, you know, I hear that uh, Jordan was from North Carolina, and uh, I mean, when you're a kid from a small town, anything you see on TV just seems so big and so foreign. Because, you know, you hadn't you hadn't seen much of the country and much of the world, um, but then to know that there's people that came from the same area as you, and they're and they're doing it, it gives you hope and some belief, rather than just watching TV and thinking that it's so far fetched. You know, I'm also struck that both you and Eddie Pope played multiple sports, and, and there's so much pressure now on kids to specialize, and you know, with travel soccer and with the emphasis on really playing one sport and, and sort of all year round. And I'm just wondering, from your experience, what advice would you have for parents and for young kids if they're interested in pursuing professional oh, yeah. athletics, regardless of the sport? Yeah, I, I recently, when I, right when I retired, I worked with the Revolution Academy, and I learned that. I think all the academies around Major League Soccer, they don't let the kids play any other sport. They don't let them play any other sport, and then they don't let them play soccer outside of with the academy. And I don't, I don't get it. Uh, I don't understand it. I think for me, the more sports I played, I think it made me better at, at all the other sports because you, you kind of get a different perspective. But I think the reason why, biggest reason why my positioning was so good in soccer was because of basketball. Because basketball, you can't really. You can get close to someone, but, you know, you get called for a foul for reaching in, so you have to really learn how to move your feet and put your body in position to make plays, you know, rather than reacting and, and using your athleticism all, the whole time. And so I grew up playing golf and, and tennis, and golf kind of taught me patience and not getting frustrated. And tennis, you know, just more and uh, coordination and, and being thoughtful with, with your shots and stuff like that. And so I think sports are, are sports, and I think the more you can play, the better it is for you. And and you never know what you'll be good at. Uh, I think if it wasn't for my dad signing me up just to play soccer uh, because it was in the off season, I, I don't know if I would have even got into soccer because when I was young and being African-American, it wasn't necessarily the cool thing to do when I was growing up. So, you, you know, you never know. The other thing is it has to remain fun when you're young because you can play with so many kids that took soccer so serious and they ended up getting burnt out by the time they got to college and and a lot of them didn't even finish playing through college because they just had enough of it, and it just wasn't fun for them anymore. So it, you have to keep it as fun as long as you can. Um, obviously, once you're getting paid to play and your job's to win and lose, that it becomes a job then. But until then, I think it's good to keep it light and keep it fun because otherwise, you know, a kid will lose interest. So as a, as a professional athlete, I mean, what advice would you have to people who are entering either MLS or other professional leagues? I mean, what, what does it mean to be a professional, at least from your perspective? Uh, my biggest thing with being a professional is consistency. Um, the nature of that job is what have you done for me lately type business. And so you could have the best week of training, but it means nothing. To, you know, I mean, after, after those trainings are done, after that week is done, it means nothing anymore. And now what can you do on the next day? Or what can you do right now in training or right now in the game? So you have to learn how to be consistent. So when it comes to things off the field, um, your preparation for training or games, like you have to figure out what works for you. Or once you find what works for you, stick with it and just learn how to be a consistent performer. Uh, you know, your job is to use your body to, to be able to perform. So you have to, you know, take care of your body in ways that a lot of people don't don't even think about. That's the job. Can you show up and can you perform on a consistent basis? Can you be reliable to the coach? Can you be reliable to the, your other teammates? So that's my biggest thing. You know, you can have, uh, you can't have too many highs and lows being a professional athlete. You know, you have to be a consistent force uh, for the team. And so, you know, that's, I think that's your best shot. 
So I wanted to ask you about your transplant. So I know that the transplant was unsuccessful, and I'm just wondering how you managed to maintain a positive attitude and work through such a traumatic experience. Uh, yeah, that was, that was tough. I had a ton of support. Uh, I was in D.C. for the transplant, and so that's where majority of my friends and my family lives, and so or or is closer to there. So I had a ton of support at the hospital, you know, in and around the days of the transplant, and you know when we had our complications. And that helped a ton. As soon as we took it out, I mean, it was a rough probably four or five days, but as soon as we ultimately took it out and I started dialysis again, I was feeling so much better. And so that helped too. Because as soon as I got back up here to Massachusetts and I was back on my regular dialysis schedule, I was feeling back to myself. And that's ultimately what I wanted to feel. It's tough going to dialysis, but the fact that it helps me to feel the way that I do, you know, I don't mind it. And I, you know, the way we did our transplant, I had a friend donate to me, but we did the, like, swap program. And so her kidney actually went to someone else, and I was getting someone else's kidney that wanted to donate to the other the recipient. So we were, both recipients were getting better matches, which ultimately meant less medication for the rest of our lives and just a kidney that probably was going to last us longer. Uh, so we went through the exchange program, and her kidney worked just fine for the other recipient, and, and mine just didn't. And so I just changed my thinking about it, and that because my my donor, of course, she was uh, very upset about it, and um, and I told her, I think you know everything happens for a reason. I think that someone was more sick than I was and needed a kidney worse than I did, and we were able to get her one because. Obviously, if she got the one from uh, the donor that she was going to go with or that wanted to donate to her, uh, it, it just didn't work. So um, so it was, it was a good thing that we did, and, and I feel good, and I think that helps her to get through it. So I was more worried about her than I was myself because I was, I was fine. Like, I was back on my regular schedule and back to work, and, and you know, I just had to do dialysis. Which is which I'm um, you know I've learned to to live with so I was fine um, I, I was yeah just wanted needed to cheer her up and make sure that that she was okay for the longest time I tried to deny my illness and when I became knowledgeable about it that's when I kind of got a hold of it and I was able to really not totally control it but I could slow it down and then I, I you know I had the information to know what to do as soon as something needed to be done with, uh, as far as dialysis. So uh, I think that that helped me a lot, and a lot of people don't get that. But if we can raise awareness beforehand, I think it would help a lot of people. You know, I'm struck that you're, you're raising the importance of awareness and, and the fact that we as a community need to do more to get the public to care about kidney disease. And, and you know, you're in a unique position because as, a, as an athlete, other athletes will listen to you, and, and there have been so many athletes who have had kidney disease, and it affects people and their families as well. It, what yeah. advice would you have for our audience as to how to engage it just seems that, that Major League Soccer or the National Football League or the National Basketball Association, that one of those leagues should get more involved in kidney awareness and, and kidney disease um, prevention and, and funding for kidney research. Any suggestions as to what we could do? Uh, I mean, I think just continue to get the word around. I think personally, I think the real people that could help are the people that have donated because they're the real heroes and they're still walking around perfectly living their normal lives. I think those are the people that people need to see and need to talk to, really, um, because, you know, people are dealing with all kinds of things and all kinds of sicknesses. And so, you know, it's really tough for people that have dealt with other things or have other things going on and had kidney disease hasn't hit home to them to really take note and see that there's a big problem. But if they can sit there and see someone that has donated and see what, what that's done to someone else's life, and both of them are perfectly normal, I think that's what's going to encourage people to want to do the same or, you know, see that they can do the same. Well, and also you have obviously a really strong network of support with your family and your friends like your friend Portia. Um, are, are there others yeah. in your life that are involved in your fight against kidney disease? Yeah, um, I remember – I got together with some of my friends in D.C. when we realized I needed a kidney, and we got a big uh, email together and got a basically an email chain and sent it out to a bunch of people, asked them to forward it to people, and um, within the first week, we had uh, 35 people ca uh, call into Georgetown wanting to get tested. And so I don't even know everyone's name, but 
I just know there's a bunch of people wanting to get tested, seeing if what they can do. Um, I know some people are interested, even if even if they aren't a match for me, to maybe help someone else. And so, uh, I mean, obviously, I've been very lucky to have a lot of close friends and themselves having a lot of friends that they care about my situation. But not everyone is that lucky. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I just think we just got to continue to get the word out there. Well, Mr. Sims, thank you very much for taking the time for today's discussion. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This podcast is copyrighted by the American Society of Nephrology, all rights reserved. All content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be medical advice. This podcast should not be used in a medical emergency or for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. Please consult your doctor or other qualified healthcare provider if you have any questions about any medical condition or before taking any drug, changing your diet, or commencing or discontinuing any course of treatment. Thank you for listening to this podcast of the American Society of Nephrology. Thank you.